biases because um, I was listening to a, an interview with Martin Luther King Jr.'s son um, last week, and he was saying that people are buying guns, um, getting ready for an aftershock of the election. And you're saying, is this is this America that 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 we're hearing this from? And the truth is that obviously with access to guns, it's not going to happen. But if the devil has his way, we know what could happen after after election, and we're going to pray against that. And then for the UK, we have the issue of this of coronavirus and how some how the government is handling things, whether or not you think it's good or bad, it's having an effect on everyone. Jobs are being lost left, right, and center. Mental health is a big issue for so many people. Almost feels like the young people are just like, you know, whatever, I'm just gonna do what I want to do anyway. And then we have the issue of Brexit which almost feels like it's just disappeared, but it's there and it's real. And we know what Boris Johnson said a couple of weeks ago about the no deal Brexit. And we just feels like we're living in an uncertain time. And so this is what I want us to get our prayer. I'm gonna open, I'm gonna start the prayers first, but I'm gonna select some people please to pray for each of these countries. And uh, like Pastor Sureka has so fondly taught us we are all pastors here, so you're called ready to pray anytime the time comes. Um, so I'm going to start a prayer first, and I'm going to just want uh, give Pastor Bayo a heads up and uh, Reverend Yemi. Uh, Pastor Bayo, I'd like you to pray for Nigeria. I'd like you to pray for the governance of Nigeria. I'd like you to pray for the leadership of Nigeria. I'd like you to pray for a change, you know, a seismic move from heaven. And I want Reverend Yemi to pray for the young people in Nigeria, for the youths in Nigeria. Because one of the sad things that we saw were some people, some young people being, being paid off to sabotage the movement that's meant for their future as well. So I want you to pray for the young people in, in, in Nigeria um, so that the future that we want is the future that we're fighting for and we don't burn it with our own hands. So I'm going to start off and then it will be Pastor Bayer and then Pastor Yemi. And after that, I'll just come in to introduce the next round. And so Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we just pour you into this place. Into, we, we, we thank you, Lord, for being here with us. The book of 2 Kings chapter 6, when Elisha was speaking to his servant and the servant was scared. And Lord, it feels like at times, Lord, at this moment, actually, fear is present. But Lord, you spoke through Elijah and he said, open his eyes so that he will see that those who are with us are those that who are with them. Your word in the book of 2 Kings 18 and 19, when Hezekiah went to pray. And, and he, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth. And so Lord, today metaphorically and spiritually we are putting on sackcloth today and we're interceding for nigeria we're interceding for the u.s we're interceding for the united kingdom we're interceding for france we're interceding for our world today and lord today we come against every oppression of the enemy in the name of jesus we come against every greed inspired leadership we come against, oh God, every, every violent, inspired leadership. Lord, we come against the noise. We come against the confusion. And Lord, we just breathe your spirit of peace, your spirit of clarity, your spirit of, of wholeness, your spirit of, of understanding, your spirit of love, Jesus. We speak your authority into our world. We speak your authority into Nigeria. We speak your authority into the United States. We speak your authority into the United Kingdom. A lot as I'm praying, I'm just praying again for the United States of God, where religion and politics have so mixed up that it's hard to tell one from the other. Today, I pray, oh God Almighty, for a sifting. I pray, Lord, for a sifting, oh God, that Christians, the church, will stand under the banner of Jesus Christ. Not behind a, per a person, but behind your leadership so that the church of God can give the leadership that you desire, can give the hope, the inspiration that you desire. This we pray, oh God, and I just commit this time of prayer and prophecy onto your hands, oh God, that Lord, you open the floodgates of heaven, open our minds to discern and to hear what you're saying, oh God, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Pastor Bayer, please. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, we thank God for this prayer session. And as we are going to pray for the nation, Nigeria, we've heard what Pastor Kenneth said to us. 
He has narrated everything that happened in the nation. So the first prayer point, I would like you to join me in this prayer together to pray for healing mm -hmm. because already the nation has been separate, segregated in part of religion, in part of even to the worst. Now youth are being seen as an entity whereas the future belongs to the youth. That Father, let there be healing, O oh Lord. Amen. Join me, brother. Father, let there be healing over Amen. the nation of Nigeria Father, against Amen. every division in the healing. name of Jesus. Amen. Be it religious division, be it tribal division, oh, even no. being age Father, bracket division. Father, because the nation is for everybody, Amen. and we know the future belongs to the youth. Oh, and the youth are asking for their rightful part. They are asking for their rightful oh, no. position in the nation because they don't want the adult or the parent that have destroyed the future to continue in destruction and yet the blood of this young one has been wasted for nothing we've had a lot of news a lot of information about people that just disappeared father lord we pray let there be healing in the name of jesus Lord. between the warring party the youth that holds the future and the adult that refuse to relinquish power father bring healing between both of love in terms of religious division, bring us together, O oh Lord. Yes. We know that you have come to rule and reign. Rule over Nigeria, O oh Lord, Amen. and let your name be glorified Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to pray again for the youth because most especially the future, I believe, I believe belongs to them. And we are already in a nation that we know how things work. Mm. Human rights, mm. equality rights. And this is missing in the nation. The Father, Lord, let there be transformation in the name of Jesus. Amen. That the power will be transformed from the youth, I mean, from the adult to the youth. Amen. And the things will reign in the name of Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. The that the power that be, every strong God, every power of darkness that's holding the nation and Nigeria back in ways of moving forward, Father, let those power be destroyed in the name Amen. of Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. Jesus. Our Lord and God, you are the half and the omega. You know today, tomorrow, Father, Lord, tomorrow it belongs to this youth, O oh Lord. We are solidly praying before them, O oh Lord. Father, Lord, empower them in the name of Jesus, O oh Lord. The power of the vision that they are trying to bring among them, let those power be destroyed in the name of Jesus, O oh Lord. Righteousness exalt a nation. Righteousness exalt a nation. Let righteousness reign in Nigeria, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. That the corrupt political elites, they will relinquish power to the youth. And you come and rule and reign. Lord Jesus, it's not even enough for the youth themselves to take over but for you to rule through them and to know what to do, O oh Lord. Father, we pray, O oh Lord, that whatever will be the best for the nation is what we are asking for, O oh Lord. That bloodshed will reduce, that will, even there will be no more longer bloodshed in the nation. Kidnapping will come to our head. We just have a kidnapping of a pastor, of a minister of God in church. Father, not let this stop in the name of Jesus, O oh Lord. That enough, enough, enough is enough of shedding of innocent blood. Father, Lord, God, my dear Lord, you say the blood of Abel cry aloud. Father Lord, the blood of those who have died unjustifiably in the nation. Let it cry unto you, O Lord, Amen. in the name Amen. of Jesus. Amen. If we had the cry of the children of Israel in wilderness, Amen. and you raise Moses up, Father, we pray, O Lord, the leader for the nation, that we move the nation forward, that we transform the nation, that we turn it out of the people back to you in Nigeria. Father, Amen. raise us a leader up in the name of Jesus, O Lord. We want a leader that fear you. We want a leader that know you. We want a leader that have a good relationship with you. That will bring justice to everybody. Because without justice, nobody will be healed. Let that be healed in the name of Jesus. Amen. And let your name be glorified, O Lord. Amen. Last year, Lord and God, we pray, O Lord, for the protest that I just ended is for a purpose. Nothing happened without your hand in it, O Lord. We pray, O Lord, the fire that has ignited, let it not die in the name of Jesus, O Lord. Amen. Let's see the end of those who are bringing brutality to the nation Amen. and let your name be glorified, O Lord. Amen. Father, Lord, you know what to do, O Lord. Yes, Whatever Lord. it takes Amen. to clean the nation, Amen. do it, O Lord, and let your name be glorified. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Bayo. Um, uh, from Reverend Yemi, if we could keep it to about two minutes, please, so that we can go through the rest as well. So please just continue, just praying for, for, for the youth. It's something that Pastor Bayo said, and I said the last time we prayed for Nigeria, is that on the Global Terrorism Index, for countries most affected by terrorism, Nigeria is, is uh, I think, uh, top, top five, and you wouldn't know that. So I just want you to please pray, Pastor Yemi, to pray for the youth, and to pray that the hope that they have will not die. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, Amen. Lord, we just want to thank you. We bless your holy name. We thank you because you are a faithful and a loving God. We thank you because you are the God of all nations. We exalt you. We thank you, Lord. We commit the youth unto your holy hand in Nigeria, Lord. We pray, Father, that you will keep this one's mighty God. You will begin to open their eyes unto you. Father, King of glory, help them to know you. Let their hearts turn to you, mighty God. And we pray, Father, King of glory, that they hope, Father, King of glory, their hope will not die. That, Father, King of glory, you will give them reason to look forward to the future. You will give them a reason to live. You will give them a reason, mighty God, to look, Father, King of glory, towards what you have in store for them. And we pray, Father, King of glory, that every evil hidden agenda of the wicked one, of the pit of hell, Father, King of glory, you will destroy. Father, King of glory, we pray, Lord, that this youth, Father, King of glory, everlasting Father, you begin to open doors, Father, unto them, mighty God. We pray, Father, King of glory, you will walk through that nation. Father, you will cleanse that nation, Lord. Our our future generation, Father, will not be destroyed, mighty God. We pray, Father, for this youth, you will strengthen them, Father, King of glory. Lord, we pray, Lord Jesus, that Father, everlasting Father, in everything that they do, Lord, we pray they will submit to your will, they will submit to your power, they will submit, Father, to your glory, your peace will reign, Father, King of glory, in their hearts, your peace will reign in their lives, your peace will reign all over that nation. Lord, Father, King of glory, you will establish them in that nation nation, mighty Amen. God. Everything, Father, that King of glory that is missing, Father, for them to live the life, Daddy, that you want them to live. We pray, Father, you will arise in your power and you will make everything possible for them. In the name of Jesus, their expectation will not be cut short. In the mighty name of Jesus, thank you, mighty God. We bless you. We honor you. Jesus, mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. As, as um, um, Reverend Yemi was praying, um, my spirit it just directed me onto, onto a different style. So for the United States, I'm going to get through people to just proclaim. Again, we're seizing authority. So I'm going to get, get Pastor um, Jonathan to get ready, um, Pastor Femi to get ready, and Anne as well to get ready, please. We're just going to proclaim and declare over the United States of America because we are coming into a critical point. And I think we all know this. As a non-American, I know that whatever happens in America is going to be impacted. And we just want to just proclaim, you know, we are taking authority in the name of Jesus. So I'm just going to ask Pastor Jonathan first, our residential American, if you just want to just speak into the states and just like just proclaim for the next one minute. And then uh, Pastor Femi Strano for the next one minute. And then Anne for the next one minute, just proclaim into the states. Amen. Lord God, we give you thanks for the nation of America, for the people and for uh, for your sovereign hand over that country. Lord, we pray right now that as we move into this election uh, night that's coming up on Tuesday, God, that your will would be done. Lord, we are confident that you are watching and you are guiding and that whatever comes, you have authority. So Lord, we ask that your name be lifted up again in every part of the US. God, we pray, Spirit of God, move and bring peace, God. Spirit of God, move and bring restoration. Spirit of God, move. Lord, we pray that there would no longer be this divide between parties and political ideologies, Lord, but a unity in you. And God, that each person who claims the name of Jesus would hold fast to you, not holding on to their political identity first and foremost, but just knowing they belong to you, King Jesus, and that in that way they would look on their brothers and their sisters, every person in that country, and would see your image, God, imprinted on them, shining from them, God, that we would be, uh, again, a nation that looks and sees and declares that, that this is a nation founded on principles that are yours, Lord. And so we pray, God, move in power, move in power, God, we pray that every obstacle and every enemy move that would come to try and hinder your ways in that nation, Lord, would be stopped in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 
Father, we just declare right now as your church over the US, we declare firstly unity in the name of Jesus. Father, I still remember the, one of the prayers of Jesus was let them be one as we are one. And that's what he prayed for his church, oh God. And Lord, we pray over the US right now, every spirit of division, every spirit that is causing people to rise up against each other. Lord, everything that has been swelling for time and swelling for generations that's causing divides and hatreds and killing them and, and all these things to happen. Lord, we bring us stop to it right now in the name of Jesus your church stands to say no more today father whoever is using your name lord we know sometimes politicians use your name as a campaign slogan but lord even as they've called your name into that into the us as they've called your name into the elections they've called your name and said that they are christians as they've called your name into various situations we ask that you step in oh god over the us over every situation that's happening in the name of jesus father you are god anything that you allow you allow because you are great and lord we know that the u.s is a country that you have used oh god and you continue to use to spread the gospel so lord we pray in the name of jesus that the division will stop oh god that people will be united under the name under the banner of jesus that there'll be no more hatred no more division no more murder no more killing no more of all these things oh god that that bring pain to your heart oh god lord i even pray for the candidates let them experience you oh god like never before let them have meetings an encounter with you holy spirit because that will change them and that will change the nation oh god so we ask for unity over that nation in the name of jesus no more bloodshed no more violence in the name of jesus but lord bring them back together under the one banner that unites all men which is the banner of christ in jesus name we pray amen if, if Anne is ready please Okay, Anne, are you, are you with us? Okay, uh, while, while Anne is getting ready, um, what I was saying, I, I didn't realize I was mute, muted before, is I just want us to just proclaim over, over the, we just need to take authority over the UK, over the US. I just, I, I feel pressed in my spirit that we should all just, just speak. So if you want to unmute all your mics, please, we're just going to pray together. Just speak into the atmosphere for like for the next 30 seconds and then we'll, we'll check if Anne is ready. Just unmute your mic and just speak. Just speak authority right now. Just just speak for the next 30 seconds. Let's just go. Let's just get my cousin. Lord Jesus, we take authority. We take authority. We take authority. We take authority. In the name of Jesus, we take authority over the atmosphere. We take authority over whatever the enemy is planning on. Authority in the name of Jesus. Authority in the name of Jesus. Authority in the name of Jesus. Authority in your name, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, every nation, things in heaven, things on earth, and things underneath the earth, and every creature that Jesus is in God. So, Lord, we take authority in your name. And pray every knee bows in Jesus' name. Every knee bows in Jesus' name. Every spirit of confusion bows in Jesus' name. Every spirit of division bows in Jesus name. Every spirit of hatred bows in Jesus name. Every spirit of violence bows in Jesus name. No, we proclaim your unity. Proclaim your strength. Proclaim your in Jesus name. In Jesus name. Hallelujah. Um, is 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 um. I'm ready. Okay. Um, we're gonna go over to the UK now. Hopefully, we have a chance to come back to Anne. And I just want. Um, Pastor John, um, um, uh, Pastor Soroka, you're going to run off for us. And when you run off for us, I want you to also please pray for France. We're going to have Pastor uh, John Mark and um, um, Pastor Dasaolu and um, Pastor Joy to just, I'm sorry about the time, uh, to just please, just again, all I just want you to please is just tap into the spirit and just proclaim 
and just decree over the United Kingdom. Uh, you have about uh, 45 seconds each. Just proclaim and just decree unto the United Kingdom, please. So start from Pastor John Mark, please. Hallelujah. We decree peace and we decree grace to the United Kingdom. We decree peace and grace from the top to the lowest person in this kingdom. You care about every single person. You don't make any differentiation between those that are high and those that are low. And we decree that we want peace. We want your grace. We want your love to pour out across this land. That we want to see the things that are going wrong turn around. We want to see the things that are infecting us stop dead in their tracks and just fall to nothing. We decree peace and love and grace and mercy your peace, your love, your grace, your mercy, and we say stop. Anytime there is indivision, every time there is indecision, every time there is a, a fight or anxiety, Lord, we just say and decree, stop in the name of Jesus. Pour out your love, pour out your grace, Lord. This is what we pray. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. So, Father, we make a declaration as your people over the United Kingdom. We declare and decree hell for this nation. We put a stop to the reoccurrence of the pandemic. The world says our people will not rise a second time. Therefore, we make a declaration. COVID-19 will not rise a second time over the United Kingdom. Everywhere that has been paralyzed, they begin to receive life. Every business, every spiritual health that has been dwindling, we will pray they receive health and strength. Grace to increase. Grace to go back to the place of prayer. We will release it upon the United Kingdom. Grace that will release upon this nation. When COVID-19 started, that people were asking for prayer. People were asking for prayer. We release that grace upon this nation again. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. Thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Jesus, oh God. Lord, we're praying, oh God, even Lord, for this country, oh God. I know you love this country, oh Jesus, and declare, oh God, that you're going to give knowledge and wisdom, Lord, to all our leaders, oh God, that even Lord, whatever is happening around us from the Brexit, oh God, and handling of this COVID pandemic, oh Lord, I pray that knowledge and wisdom will be upon our leaders, oh God. And Lord, I pray, oh God, whatever decisions they're making, it will not cost the next generation of oh God. Lord, I pray there will be no services that will be sacrificed, oh God, because of these, their decisions, oh God. Lord, I pray let your principles prevail, oh God. Let your guidance prevail, oh God, in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, whatever happens, it will be according to your will, oh God. Lord, thank you, Jesus, that you're going to have your way in this country, oh God. Have your way in this nation, oh God, that it will heal this land, oh Lord. It will heal your people, oh God. And I pray, Lord, that it will benefit the next generation, oh God. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. And there will be equality, oh God. There will be no sacrifices, oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for this time. Before I hand over to Pastor Sereka, there's a word that the, the Lord is leaving on my heart. And it's, it's this image that do not be overcome. Again, I go back to 2 Kings um, 6, uh, where Elisha was telling uh, his servant that those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And there's this feeling of, of being overwhelmed, that we are afraid of the Red Sea, not the God who can split the Red Sea. So I just want us to just um, as we continue in prayer, this is a yearning in me to just continue in prayer, but I know we're going to start now, is that for us to just tap into that reality that we have a God who splits the rest and we are not afraid of the Red Sea. And it may feel like the things that we are facing now in the world is overwhelming and it feels like our prayer is not doing anything. But I just want us to just remain in that authority that God has given us control and we will turn the tide in the name of Jesus and the sea will split in two so that we can cross through. So that the Holy Spirit is living in my heart today that we just that God is bigger than the Red Sea. The name of Jesus. Uh, over to you, Pastor. 
Amen. Amen. And Father, we just want to conclude this time of uh, prayer. And uh, Lord, I just want to thank you, Father, because we know that even as we pray for nations, Father, you are the God of all the nations. Lord, whether it's Nigeria, whether it's the UK, whether it's the US, whether, Lord, even France right now, Father, we, we've seen even the, once again, Lord, the evil, the bloodshed that is happening. And so, Father, we want to pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that every spirit that is craving for blood will be bound in Jesus' name. And Father, would you even expose every plan and scheme of the enemy in the name of Jesus? And we pray, Lord, even your safety, your security over France and, Lord, even across Europe, even in this season, Father. Lord, where the enemy can be so subtle to come and destroy lives. And, Father, we, we want to bless you for this evening. Thank you, God, for even the many nations that are represented, Lord, even through our family. And so, Father, we thank you that every prayer we prayed, we know that they have been held before the throne of God in heaven, in those golden balls, being brought before the Lord in intercession continually. So, Father, we want to give you glory, honor, and praise tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, once again, welcome, welcome, welcome. I know we, you know, we should have been all together in uh you know in a in a in a conference hall but you know this is as good or you know this is this is better not better sorry but this is at least we can come together we thank god for technology and you know the lord connects us by his spirit and uh and so that's that's such a wonderful thing kushani you want to yes just want to welcome everyone sorry. So lovely to see you all. So lovely, lovely to see uh, uh, everyone here. And just want to say thank you for joining us. Uh, we are going to just experience such a presence of the Lord uh, even during these next 48 hours. And uh, special welcomes as well. I want to welcome uh, Pastor Thomas Hoban yes. from Ireland. Uh, I want to welcome Thomas, uh, who's our Foursquare pastor in Ireland. Uh, glad to have you, Tom. And also, we have a, another very special guest with us uh, tonight, and that is Ken Baird. Welcome, Ken. Hi. Ken, do, do you want to unmute yourself and maybe greet the family? Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Thank you for letting me join in with you tonight. Really appreciate that. Looking forward to this. Oh, you're always welcome, Ken. You're part of the family. <laughs> so we're going to go into a time of worship. And um, so let's uh, start the video. Okay. I just want us to go into a moment of just inviting God. God into our presence, God into our midst right now. As we go into this time of worship, I just want us to invite God with our hearts. With our hearts, let's call upon the presence of the Lord to come and join us in our midst today. Because the Bible makes us understand that we cannot come into his presence unless we have thanksgiving in our hearts and his praises in our lips. So I just want us to just begin to thank the, thank the Lord. Lift up your voices and just thank him for everything he has done for you. Just thank him for everything that he has enabled you to do today, for everything that he has enabled you to be. For you are here right now in his presence. So let's just begin to thank the Lord. Let's just begin to thank the Lord. Lift up your voices, lift up your voices and thank him. And thank him for the breath of life in your lungs. To thank him for your children. To thank him for your husband. To thank him for your wives. To thank him for your jobs. To thank you for being alive, for your two legs, your two feet, your two eyes, your two arms. Yes, so many things we take for granted, but if we did not have the Lord on our side, if we did not have the Lord on our side, so let's just thank him, lift up our voices and thank him and begin to invite him into our presence. Begin to invite him into our presence as we go into this time of worship. For everything that we have planned for today, let's just thank him and invite him into our midst, O oh Lord. Here we are. Lifting our hands to you. Here we are. Give 
giving you thanks for all you do and as we praise and worship your holy name you are here dwelling within our praise we we'll lift our voice and say here we are lifting our hands to you here we are Let's lift our hands to the Father. Here we are, giving you thanks for all you do. And as we praise and worship your holy name, you are here, dwelling within our praise. Dwelling within our praise, we welcome you, Father. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, into our midst, into our presence. Yes, oh God. Yes, Lord, we just want to worship you. We just want to worship you in spirit and in truth. down and worship him worship him oh worship him bow down and worship him worship him oh worship him voices and say bow down and worship him worship him oh worship him bow down and worship him worship bow down right now let's go and bow down and worship him we bow with our hearts we prostrate oh god bow down and worship him worship him oh worship him 
Before the Father, before our Maker, the Giver of life, we bow before you. We bow before you. We bow before you. I just want you to create some space right now and physically bow before the Father. Let's go on our knees if we can. And if you cannot, the Father looks at our hearts. He looks at the posture of our hearts. If we are bowing down to Him, if we humble ourselves, if we humble ourselves before Him, before Him, before Him.
so give me you Lord give me you and I will love you Lord my strength so I will him I want us to exalt him so that he's the utmost importance in our lives the song says give me you that everything else could wait that means that we must humble ourselves all of him and none of us all of him in our lives and none of us to love him to love him to exalt him to cast our crowns before him to show him to give him the glory to show him that we love him, to show him that he's the utmost importance in our lives. Yes, oh Lord. I will love, I will love you. And hallelujah, our God reigns. Thank you so much, Ayo, for that amazing time of worship. And um, <clears throat> once again, want to welcome everyone, all our pastors, leaders, youth leaders, and um, also um, I'm not, I, I couldn't uh, welcome Pastor Femi Babatola Sr. Uh, welcome, uh, Pastor Femi. And also want to welcome Renato Amato, Pastor Renato Amato, who is the national leader of Foursquare from Italy. So welcome to all our special guests uh, tonight. Tomorrow, 4 o'clock, uh, we will have um, our international president, Randy Remington. Uh, he will be speaking to us. So tomorrow's session is at 4 o'clock for all the adults. And we have a children's session at, um, I believe it's at 11.30. Right, Grace? You want to say something? Yeah. You it's going to be absolutely amazing. Um, we usually have a hallelujah party, which is a spin-off of Halloween. So, but it's all God. It's all celebration. And it's our first one. So we're, we've got a lot of exciting things jam-packed to our kids. And it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. If you know any children, send them our way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Grace. Yeah, she's doing an amazing job with our, with our children. Um, so, yeah, so tonight I want to share, I want to just share with you all a little bit on really kind of, you know, journeying through this season, through this COVID season. And um, I, you know, believe that uh, uh, some of you, uh, you know, kind of uh, took part in the poll uh, as you came into the Zoom um, uh, room. And it's interesting that 97% of us believe that we have to rethink the way that we do church you know that's that's an overwhelming um uh, kind of you know figure that 97 uh, percent of us will, are, are saying the same thing and i believe that's what god's speaking to all of us even through this season and um am i on the screen um so you know um a friend of mine actually um, you know, uh, put up this picture on um, Facebook, and I and I thought this is a this is a great picture because that said, is this what the world and the church is going through? You know, you can see the old um, you know outer layer being stripped out, and a fresh new layer coming coming through. And you know, this season has been called. You know, people have said it's a reset, but I think you know, for us as leaders, 
you know, what, you know, a question that we need to ask ourselves is what are we stripping? What are we, you know, embracing even through this season into where the Lord is leading us? And, you know, tonight, um, more than me giving you any answers, you're going to walk away with a lot of questions <laughs> so that, you know, we can begin to think through, we can begin to ponder upon in what the Holy Spirit is, is saying to us. And, you know, to start off, um, I want to just share a scripture from the book of Joshua, chapter 3, and verse 4, the second part of verse 4. Joshua chapter 3, uh, the second part of verse 4, and it says, For you have not passed this way before. And then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves. Tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And, you know, I think, you know, all of us would say, yeah, we have not been in, you know, we have not gone this way before. And, um, you know, the pandemic, in a sense, surprised the church. But I do not think it surprised God. You know, we, we, we were all taken by surprise. You know, I was in Australia, and if I delayed by a week, I would have been still there. And, uh, you know, none of us thought or none of us even imagined right at the beginning of this year what 2020 would, would, would look like. But I, I, I strongly sense that, you know, if, if we believe that the pandemic did not surprise the Lord, then he has a strategy. He has a pathway for his church. And, and uh, so, you know, that's what I want to kind of really kind of begin to look at begin to even, you know, inspire you, challenge you on, on, on some of the uh, areas. Um, you know, to start off, you know, let's take a look at so what, what, I, what we call a pandemic culture. You know, in a pandemic culture, we see a lot of chaos happening. You know, we see a lot of fear. And, you know, interesting, even amongst the church, you know, there are many Christians, you know, who are in fear. And there's a sense of a disconnectedness. You know, there seems to be some sort of a disconnection. You know, you know, we would love to come together, but yet we have, we are not together. And also, you know, being overwhelmed by what's happening. You know, even through the technology, you know, someone, you know, right at the beginning kind of was talking about, you know, the overwhelming nature of even Zoom meetings, one after each other. And so in a pandemic culture, you know, we see these aspects beginning to happen. And then, you know, we have the voices, we have the, the noises that begin to inspire us. And if we begin to listen to the voice of man, you know, where there is chaos, there's going to be fear. And where there's fear, there's going to be confusion. When we begin to, you know, get inspired by just the media or what, you know, people are simply saying. And, you know, there's going to be isolation. People are going to isolate themselves. And emotional, people are going to be emotionally drained. And, you know, uh, you know and I have, I have seen, you know, some people even, you know, going through this. But as leaders, as the church... We need to be listening to God's voice. And I know that all of us have been listening to the voice of the Spirit in what He has been telling us. And, you know, and, and that's where we can bring hope. Even to a world that is in chaos, that is having fear, it is our responsibility, it is our opportunity to bring hope and to bring assurance and, up, and, you know, where there's confusion and helping, helping people and saying the focus is about Jesus. Focus is about Jesus. And when we hear the voice of God, it's, also, uh, all, it's about being connected. Whether it's going to be through, the, through, the, through Zoom or whatever, there is a connection, but there's also a connection to him. And we begin to live out of his presence. And we, we draw from the strength 
that the Lord gives. We draw from his strength, even, even through this season. And, you know, I was, I was thinking sometimes as a leader, we feel that, you know, but I need to have all the answers. No, we don't need to have all the answers. Or sometimes we feel guilty because we are not doing church as we were doing church before. And I think, you know, that personally, I believe that it's something that the Lord even used to get a message across to the church. Because if you really look at it, we were totally stripped of everything and almost taken back to the very basics and even kind of beginning to ask ourselves, what are we doing? What is church about? Now, you know, one of the, one of the biggest mistakes we can make as church leaders is that kind of thinking, hey, I'm, I'm waiting for that perfect situation to go back to how church was. Almost in a sense of saying COVID never, ex kind, of, kind of a COVID never existed situation. But I believe that the Lord has taught us something through this season. And that's what we need to embrace. That's what we need to begin to build on even into, into the season that we are, we are walking through. You know, another mistake that as church leaders we could make is that if we don't learn anything from this past stroke present season, because there's so much to be learned. There's so much to be embraced. And uh, thirdly, it's also not making the changes that we, are, we have to make. And the fourth thing is also, you know, and, and I've seen this even in, you know, with some of my friends overseas, is that a lack of vision. You know, it's simply because there is a pandemic, simply because there is a lockdown, that does not mean that we cannot have a vision that the Lord begins to release to us. You know, the world may not know where it's going, but if God, again, I'm going back to that thing, if COVID did not surprise the Lord, then he has a vision for us. He has a direction that we are to move in. You know, if you just take a moment, what are the three top key learnings that you have embraced even through this COVID pandemic season? You know, what are, what are, what are some of the uh, key learnings that you have you have embraced that you are building on because I believe that's what's important. You know, even for Joshua, the Lord was saying, "You have not gone this way," and and it was like, "Yeah, it's a fresh it's a fresh journey for all of us." But it's like hearing what is the Holy Spirit saying? How is He taking us through? And um, you know, Paul Mainwaring, uh, you know, who teaches on strategic. Uh, strategy for churches. He said, you know, we are in the same storm, but we are in different boats. And how we navigate through this season is essential. Isn't that true? It's the same storm that all of us are facing. But how is your boat? How is my boat? How am I navigating my boat through this season? How is the boat of Foursquare GP navigating? You know, how, how is the church in the UK navigating through this season? You know, through, through, through these past couple of months, I've been really meditating on David and Goliath. And it's interesting that David and Saul heard the same threats by Goliath. But they both responded in two different ways. And, you know, as, as a leader, again, another question I'm asking is like, what are some of the strategic changes that the Lord has asked you to do? What are some of those changes that he has impressed on your heart, on your leaders? You know, when we look at the book of Joshua, um, you know, Joshua goes to attack Jericho. And right at the inset, uh, you know, he, he, Joshua goes to see and, and strategize over, over Jericho. But then he meets the commander of the army of the Lord. And Joshua's strategy changes to God's strategy. And Joshua literally has to lay down everything before the Lord. And he comes away from that encounter. He comes away from that presence. 
with a strategy that does not fit into human understanding, a strategy that does not uh, comprehend in the mind of a warrior. And that was go around Jericho. Joshua was strategizing to go straight into Jericho. But the Lord was saying, go around Jericho because I am leading you. And I believe that's, that is the truth even for us, that he is leading us. He is guiding us. You know, um, another uh, example is, again, I'm going back to David and Goliath. You know, David's life changed from being a lunch boy <laughs> to becoming a warrior. Why? Because through the, the, the situation, he allowed the destiny God had for him to come forth. And for, for many of us, you know, you know, I know, you know, we've been pastors for many years. Some of you have been pastors for your whole life. But yet, is there something that the Lord wants to call forth out of you in this season? To define more of who you are and what he is calling you to be. You know, for me, one day I was praying um, in my sitting room. And right at the beginning of COVID, and, and the question the Lord asked me is, why should the church suffer through this season? Why should there be a decline in my church? And that really got me thinking. And out of that, the Lord began to talk to me a lot on raising up micro churches and training micro church leaders. And I'm, you know, I will share a little bit at the end uh, tonight on, on micro churches. And the Lord began to, you know, challenge me. The Lord began to speak to me. And I had to begin to work on that. The Lord gave me a vision that over the next year for me to raise up at least 100 micro church leaders. You know, something else that I'm seeing is that the Lord's calling us even to build up uh, what I called X8 disciples. Disciples that whatever happens, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's persecution, that wherever they go, that they will preach the gospel, they will heal the sick, they will cast out demons, and they will plant churches. Imagine if we if all our churches are trained, or we change, or train all the people in our churches like that. You know, our churches should be thriving. Our churches should be growing. And so I believe it's an important season for us as leaders. And, you know, as much as I'm sharing this with you, I'm talking to myself as well. And, you know, because I, I you know, God is looking for a different type of leader in this season. He's not looking for the leader that follows the masses. He's looking for a leader who is fearless, who's not scared to make, to make cho certain choices. You know, like David. David was not scared to go and face Goliath. You know, he's looking for leaders who are proactive, who are willing to lead in a different manner. Because that's what COVID is doing to us. The, you know, many of us were not even online. But yet we had to make changes. We had to become different. And our leadership has to be different in this season. You know, the prophetic, the apostolic leadership needs to rise up within us. And we need to be leaders who know the heart of God. You know, where am I? And, you know, the question is, how do I help lead my communities? God is looking for those strong leaders. You know, Peter, you know, he had, he had tried fishing, all, you know, throughout the night. And, the, you know, another question is, what voices are influencing us in this season? What are those voices that are influencing us? You know, for, you know this is something that I posted on uh, social media a couple of uh, months ago, knowledge and experience could have prevented Peter from the catch of his life. But it was his faith and obedience that made him throw the net to the other side. You know, we could say, yeah, you know, we don't know. Or, you know, we have had all this experience and we could, we could lean on our experience. But I go back to 
Joshua, we have not gone this way before. Yes, there will be some sort of things that we can take from our experience. But yet, there is something brand new. And God is calling us to lead. Lead our communities well. There are challenges. But yet, he's calling us to lead well. As we move in the prophetic, as we move in the apostolic. And as we respond to him. You know, I want to go through a couple of questions with you all. And, you know, there are eight questions I'm going to put, put up. Uh, and, you know, I will make this available uh, for all of you. But here's the first one is, what has God said? And, and, and what has he done? You know, what has he spoken to you? You know, what testimony or victory of your life do you most want to see repeated? See, what I'm addressing tonight is not just how we lead the church, but first how we lead ourselves. Because as a leader, if I'm not allowing myself to be led by the Spirit, and if I'm, if I'm not you know, moving forward, I can't lead the church. So you know, what has God said? What has he done even in your life? What stories are you holding on to in this season? The next question is, What has God said he will do? What are those words that the Lord has spoken over you, over your church? What prophecy, dream, you know, do you want to even see being fulfilled? You know, th that there, are, there have been prophecies that have been spoken over me about 25, 30 years ago. There was one by Pastor Leslie where he was talking about, you know, walking on the waves of revival for me. And I'm like, yes, Lord, I want to see that happen. I want to see that happen in this season. You know, what, you know I, I would encourage you to go back to some of the prophetic words that you have recorded or you have written down that, that people have spoken over you. What has God said he will do? The third one is who does God say that he is? It's an important question because I know there are many people even questioning their faith in this season. And we need to be so solid in knowing who God is. And, you know, as leaders, it's almost a given. Yeah, we know. But I believe there's something more that we can learn of him. There's something more that we can understand who he is. You know, who has God displayed himself to be to you? And as I, as I said, you know, more than telling you how to do it, I'm, I'm going to give you more questions. You're going to walk away with <laughs> loads of questions. But I would encourage you to take these questions, begin to meditate. You know, I'm working with even our national youth team with some of these questions. Because it is so important because we have not gone this way before. And we need to be asking ourselves these questions. We need to be help uh, uh, almost building a foundation and a focus as the Holy Spirit begins to give us the clarity. What does God say that you are or who you are? Go back to that. What is the Lord telling you? I'm not talking about your title. I'm talking about you as a son. I'm talking to you as, as you and God. Like, you know, the father says, he says to Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What is the Lord speaking over you? Whom is he saying you are? That is so important because that is what you're going to embrace. So that when the storms come, when the trials come, you are going to fall back on, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Because we all know the story. Just a few verses later, the devil comes and says, if you are the son of God. And there's always a challenge, especially when there is crisis. And so, you know, those questions really begin to deal with yourself. Who am I? What has God spoken to me? But then we begin to look at, out of those foundations, we then begin to build on the ministry foundation. We then begin to build on what he has called us to do. First of all, it's about who are we in this season? Number five is whom are you leading? You may say, I'm leading my, con my congregation. 
But whom are you really leading? Are you leading them? Where are they? Where are they in the journey? Remember the Lord asked them, uh, Adam, Adam, where are you? And it's almost like, where are they on the journey? Because you're on a journey. You know, you as a leader, you are on a journey. But where are they on that journey? Because these questions, I believe, are going to help us even to strategize into 2021 and beyond. Number seven is where do you want them, where do you want to get them to? Where do you want to get them to? You know, where do you want them to go? Where do you want them to move to? See, if we don't have an understanding of that, if we don't have a, a direction, we will not know where we are leading them. They will not know where they are being led. You know, I said that, you know, I've, I've, something the Lord's laying on my heart is to raise up X8 believers. And so, you know, everything I'm doing right now is also I'm trying to equip people so that they become those people. You know, what change do you need to see? What change do you need to see? Maybe you need to see some changes in certain individuals. But what are those changes? What are the changes you need to see even in the culture of your, of, your, of your community, of your church? Maybe God's calling us to change some of the culture. Maybe some of the language. And only, only you know. And, you know, being purposeful will lead us to being fruitful. Being purposeful, we have to be purposeful. You know, you may hear, you, you, I'm sure you have heard people saying 2020 has been a waste of an year. But do you know what? If we believe in a God of purpose, if we believe in a God of destiny, if we believe in a God who was not surprised by COVID, this, has, this year would be a year that will establish the church strong and the, where the Lord will launch the church into what he has. It's not a wasted year for us as a church. It's not a wasted year, but it is a strategic year. It is a decisive year for us. And, you know, these you know, three questions that I want to put up here is that, what are we planting? What are we planting? See, out of the previous questions I gave you, you know, this, these questions then should answer those, some of those things. What are you planting? Are we just teaching without a purpose? Or, you know, you know, well, you know I have a garden and I plant certain seeds. I plant certain plants with purpose. Each section in my garden, there's a purpose. And it's like, what are we, what are we planting? What's your focus? What are the seeds that you're planting? What are the teachings that you're bringing in this season? How relevant are they in seeing a fruitfulness in the, in, 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 in the season to come? Second thing is, how are we planting? You know, how are we planting? You know, what methods, what strategies are you using? You know, are you, are, you know, that, 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 is, that is so key. In how are we planting? How are we, you know, dropping those seeds? How are we, you know, uh, digging up the soil? And the third thing is, where are we planting? You know, I have a garden. You know, I have, I have, a, I have grass in the middle of my garden. I don't go and plant a tree right in the middle of my garden. But it's on the side. Of course, my dog sometimes, you know goes and digs a hole in the middle of my garden. <laughs> but where are we planting? What soil? You know, is the soil that you are planting, is it good ground? You know, whom, here's a question. Whom are you investing in? Whom are you investing in? You know, you know we have our congregations, but out of those congregations, whom are you investing? Whom are you, whom are you, you know, planting? Whom are you, you know, putting seeds into? Who are your James, you know, Peter and John? 
who are you of James, Peter, and John? Because I believe it's a, such an important thing that, we, we, that we, we have a succession culture. That we have a succession culture. You know, for me, it's about inspiring leaders, bringing them together, a younger generation. And, you know, part of, my, part of what I'm doing with, with micro churches or micro communities um, is about bringing some of the younger guys, inspiring them and saying, right, let's start planting churches. You know, we had a batch. You're going to hear from one of the young people who's going to come on a little later. And, you know, even before we uh, completed our first training with them, some of them had already started. Some of them had already started, you know, reaching out to their friends. That's what we need to see happening. You know, based on the above questions, you will be able to have a harvest and see a purpose beyond 2020. Beyond, and you know, my encouragement is start thinking about these questions. You know, love the core of who you are and what God has called you to, to be brought out even further. Don't just live in the past. But I love the core of who you are. And that's why those questions begin to address those, especially in this pandemic season. You know, I believe this is a season God has given the church to reach out to people. You know, so many people are in fear. So many people don't know what to do. You know, the, their jobs, all that. And we as the church, if we don't, if we are not reaching out and if we are not being lights in this season... We are, we're going to lose a God-given opportunity. You know, um, let's see what we have. Yeah, so I've kind of, you know, shared that. And God has not merely called us to have great meetings. You know, I just wanted to put this out there to you. Our focus is not having great meetings, but to multiply in making great disciples who would multiply in return. You know, that's, that's what the Lord, you know, to me, that's what the Great Commission is all about. You know, Je you know where did we ever see Jesus planning out his meetings? But always, it was about people. And, you know, here's something that we learned right at the beginning of COVID. You know, we ran our services on Facebook. You know, we saw so many hundreds, you know, there were days that we hit a thousand viewers but yet that that was a deception because we were losing the connection with people we were losing the one-to-ones this is this is my this is our story this is my story and immediately we said we're going to strip that because relationship and connection is important people are important even though we can't meet face to face we can meet them on my screen You know, if we are not leading people to Christ, and if we are not discipling them, then what are we doing? You know, I, I had, I, I'm asking this question from myself because, you know, I'm, 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 you know, guilty in this. You know, you know, I say this with humility. I say this with love. Let's not become a club, but a life-giving, Christ-preaching, disciple-making, multiplying community you know that's what jesus says that's what jesus that's the great commission that's what jesus has asked us to do and through this season he has given us those opportunities as i asked you earlier did jesus focus on meetings or did he focus on people and so kind of, you know, I'm, I'm going to go a little faster, but now it's like, you know, these questions I believe would help us because these questions are helping me in, in looking at church beyond COVID, beyond the pandemic, hearing what is the Holy Spirit speaking to us. You know, I spoke to you about microchurch. See, a microchurch is actually a small group of people. It can be eight, it can be 10, 
that meets anywhere and everywhere. And what do I mean by anywhere and everywhere? It's like they can meet online, they can meet at McDonald's, they can meet in the park, but it's, it's a group that is focused on discipleship, relationship, and multiplication. And a microchurch is not a cell group in your church. It's, it's not part of the a cell group, but it is a small church that may have the possibility even to grow further. And its focus is relationship, discipleship, and I'm again saying multiplication. When you look at the New Testament, you know, you see so many house churches. You know, these are communities. I was talking to Renato, and he actually said micro-communities will be a better, better option. See, again, I'm, you know, this is something that I, I want you to think about. You know, we have, we have our churches. It's not that we have not done something right. No. But there's something more that the Lord wants to do. You know, when we look at the New Testament... You know, a microchurch will have the word, will have fellowship, will have communion, will have prayer. You know, everything that is needed. But there's going to be connection, there's going to be relationship. And imagine, you know, in, in your context, if we, in your church, if you start planting microchurches, how much would you be able to influence your city? How much would your ministry grow through by planting microchurches? You know, you have the uh, example of Jerusalem or Antioch. You know, Jerusalem was the mega church. It was the big church. But, you know, out of Antioch, they were planting other churches. Would, you know, and what model would you want to use? Because of time, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just, you know, go through this quickly, but... You know, a micro church, you know, is a go church. It's a church that goes to where people are. You know, if we are really honest, every one of our friends cannot come to our church. A, it could be distance, but also if people are not, you know, who have not still come to the Lord, but there may be a, a micro church that they can join, that they can be helped to come to faith. And be discipled. You know, just take this example. Imagine if you train six individuals as to lead micro churches, and if you release them as a leader, if you release them, and they start planting micro churches, how would your church look like? How would your church grow? But here's, the some, here's something. You know, I was talking to another friend of mine just a couple of days ago, and he said, Sureka, you need to allow the microchurch to grow into four generations. He said, when it goes to the fourth generation, you really don't know who's even uh, there and what's happening there. See, we can create movements out of our churches. But just imagine, just picture this. I want you to start dreaming. Imagine you just train six people and they start a micro church during the week. Maybe from, you know, in their area or with their work colleagues or, or whatever. And then how, if that begins to grow, that begins to multiply. It's an extension ministry of your church. You know, take a look at this picture. You know, there's your church. See, we have one option where we expect everyone to come to our church there. But what if, you know, let's, you know, take an example. In your city, are you able to cover your entire city? But what if you start planting these microchurches and they in return start multiplying? And here are a couple of questions again. One location or many? Do you want to just big, grow big or Whilst having that, do you want to start using the microchurches? And one of the beautiful things is that, do we want only a few leaders or have a succession of raising leaders? Because, you know, leaders are, have to grow as the church grows. Is it about holding or is it about releasing? 
And how about being multi-generational? And uh, so right now, I want to bring on Isaac. Um, Sean, can you bring him on screen with me? Isaac Okiovo. And then we're going to have Femi come and share with us as well. Isaac, could you put your video on? And so that we can uh, add you on. Isaac, can you uh, unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Okay, maybe he's. Uh, see, I was I was going to bring Isaac, and where he was going to share with us in uh, what he has been doing because he was one of the six or seven young people that. Um, trained with me in my first batch of microchurch planters. And he got a group of his friends, and he's been working with them. And the new co the conversation that we are having right now, oh, there he is. Sean, bring him on. I want to say thank you to Sean, because he's doing all the technology here. That's that's been an easy thing for me. Are we good? Okay, I can't see because my I have a black black screen in front of me. Okay, hi Isaac, how are you doing? Hello, good evening, Pastor Shereka. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Church Foursquare family. <laughs> oh, so so lovely to have you, Isaac, and. Um, you know, we, you know, you you went through the four to five week training with me on uh, planting microchurches, and uh, would you just share briefly with everyone uh, from that point onwards? You know, how you went about starting your microchurch and where you have ended up now. Okay, so um, then. The, the first question that I'm answering is the one about how do we start the micro church? So what I did was I was, I was already um, at University of Nottingham. I'm in my third year now. So between first year and second year, I started a sort of house fellowship before I got the micro church, the micro church training. And when, after I got the micro church training, I sent a text to some of the people in the fellowship and I just posted a, a, a general sort of poll or slash questionnaire on my social media asking people who were interested in, um, interested in being part of the micro church to just message me. And um, I just made a group full of all the people that have replied to that, that poll, that questionnaire. And since then, what I've done is obviously we've been in, we've had lockdown, we've had restrictions here and there. So it's, it's something that I think I've already spoken to Pastor Femi and Pastor Sharika about how difficult it can be, how challenging it, it can be to organize it and manage it on your, on your own. Um, because in, in the group of, or the team of um, the youth that got trained to, to do the micro church planting, some of us stepped out in pairs and some of us stepped out on our own. I'm one of the people that stepped out on their own. So it's a bit hard to manage. Um, and we've had, we've had uh, in-person meetups. We, we, commute, we congregate once a week and every week we'll either go over the same discipleship content. Um, so we have the eight week um, discipleship ministry tools that Pastor Tarek has given us. So we, we've spread that over the course of the few um, the few weeks or two or three months that the microchurch has been about so far. We meet in person, go on outings, do things like bowling um, and go for dinners or meals. We have uh, also plans to do like worship nights. And as, as well as that, we also have uh, once a month, 
each member of the micro church will lead and speak on a topic of their choice. Uh, so those, those are the kind of things that we do in the micro church. Um, That's and the main, yeah, the main focus is discipleship, like Pastor Sharika has been saying. So, yeah. Yeah, discipleship, multiplication, you know, out of the relationship. And so, you know, we are, we are, we are looking now to say, okay, how... Uh, I think you, know, you have a problem because you don't have leaders to release in such a short time. The the, the micro church surprisingly uh, grew faster than I anticipated, and so we talked. We part of the training is we discuss strategy when it's time to um, you know to expand the micro church to then sort of split and send groups out again to go and pack, plant more churches. We reached that number before the time. So I was talking to Pastor Sharika last week about how do I how do I handle this situation where you plan for something to come up maybe in two to three months time, but it's come up way before. How do I adjust? What do I do? All of these sorts of things. But I think that's natural. Um, my first time doing it. And I feel that's, that's going to happen when you're doing discipleship. It's sort of a as you're going along, you're, you're learning as well. Yeah. All the time. That's great stuff, uh, Isaac. Thanks for coming on. You know, just imagine, you know, again, as leaders, you know, if we begin to raise up young people like this and we begin to equip them, empower them, and really trust them and say, you know, we are behind you. And, you know, they're, they're, they're going to help our churches get more effective. And, you know, we are going to be moving much, much more faster. And so, you know, with that, I am going to invite uh, Femi, Femi Jr., uh, who's our National uh, Youth Director, because uh, he's going to share a real passion in his heart, uh, and which is, you know, one of my passions as well. But over to you, Femi. Thank you, Pastor, and thank you, everyone, for, for being on. Um, all of you that know me know that one of my passions is raising young leaders. I think it's it's the it's one of the most beneficial things that we can do in church. Um, I think what we found and what we look at, and if we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus started his ministry with succession in mind. He called the disciples and he immediately started training them so that everything he did, they could do too. So I've kind of created a PowerPoint, a couple of really quick things I want to go through because I know time. And I'm just going to quickly share it and we're just going to run through as quickly as we can. Hope you can all see that. Yeah. I put this together and I wanted to discuss this with you. Here we have the older generation. Lots of knowledge, wisdom, experience, strategies, talents, gifts, ideas. And if we combine that with the younger generation, the power, the energy, the passion, sorry, the willingness, the time, the talents, the ideas, fearlessness, cultural awareness, their understanding of technology, we end up with a multi-generational discipling church, which is what we, we all want. I don't think there's a single leader in here who doesn't. But what happens is if we have all the, old, all the things from the older generation, but we don't have the younger generation, we end up with a single generational church, a church that isn't discipling, a church that isn't growing, a church that isn't bringing any change the concern that we, the, you know, one of the things that concerned me was when I looked at, and I actually did this, and, and sorry, pastors, you're going to tell me off later, but I'm going to ask for forgiveness now. I just did an average age of four square pastors, and I just based this roughly on, you know, things I'd seen on Facebook and bits and pieces like that. And I came to the average age of a four square pastor is 57 years old. Now, that made people like, oh, 57, that's not too bad. But if we look at it, it's very top heavy in terms of where we are. And so for us to raise this new generation, it's so important that we start working with this new generation now. And it's to, it's to kind of, and, and I say this with all the love in the world, we want your blessing not to keep asking for forgiveness. And I say that almost as a joke in, in a jokey way. But when I was younger and I was in university in the church we were in at the time, the pastor was like, oh, yeah, go and do stuff. And I would do all this stuff. People would come to the church. He'd be like, wow, that's amazing. And then it would all something would go wrong because we were young and we didn't have the wisdom. And then I'd get hauled into his office, told off, chastised. 
rebuked, you know, feel tiny, not want to do anything for Jesus, run away for like six weeks. And, and actually that was the time where he could have drawn me near. So I pulled, put together this little PowerPoint thing again, please continue to love me. I still love all of you. And what I put in here is what we need you to do. So we want you to please make room. We don't want young leaders just to function for the church's goals, but we want young leaders on leadership teams where decisions are made. It's so important that we know what you do when you're making a decision. If not, when it's our time to lead, we're just gonna do whatever we think is right and make mistakes. Have an accountability relationship. And I'm gonna come back to the video. I wanna see your faces. Tell us your mistakes. It's so important that the new generation learns the mistakes that we've made, because if not, they're destined to make the same mistakes. One of the reasons that the gospel suffered, one of the reasons Christianity died out in this nation almost, was that the older generation didn't bring the younger generation along with them. And what happens, we then had the generational divide. So people would then go to church, but their kids could stay at home. And what happened is over time, the kids stopped responding, the kids stopped believing, and we ended up in a situation where that we just had nothing. And it's to really encourage us as leaders, especially as pastors, and I'm speaking particularly to the pastors and, and the leaders in here, really, really, you know, please, please, please tell us your mistakes so we don't make them. Make decisions with us, consult and implement on agreed changes. This is so massive for young people. I, the church that we used to fellowship in when I was in uni, we would make decisions, the decisions would just be overturned. And the moment they were overturned, we were then so like, oh my goodness, you know, we just felt so disconnected. We didn't even want to serve anymore because we'd agreed something and we prayed about it and it was just thrown out. Next thing I put here, supervise what is happening, but be aware of control. And I'm talking to myself here first before all of you. As a pastor, we want to make sure everything's going okay. Sometimes it comes across as control to young people. And it's that balance of a relationship. Have a clear plan for succession. Pastor Sraker mentioned this, but who is next? Start working with them, start working on handover. This could take so many years. Um, this is one I really wanna kind of drive home. A church that doesn't have a succession plan is a church that is gonna die. And I say that very, very frankly, with all the love in the world, if you don't have a plan for who the next person in leadership is gonna be, when you step aside, or when God calls you home, or when whatever happens, that church will just cease to function because nobody knows what to do without the pastor. You know, I've got a friend who's a pastor in another denomination, and he set me a challenge. And he said to me, If you weren't in church on a Sunday, would your church function? And I said, Yes. And he said, If you weren't in church for a month, would your church function? And I said, Yes. And he said, You've done a good job. And I said, Well, God helped me, and, and I made some mistakes along the way. But it's that important succession. Who's next? Who are we training? Who are we discipling? Who are we bringing through? Who are we passing the mantle on to? Because if we're not thinking about it now, we're going to think about it when we're in a, a pressurized situation and then we could make a mistake. And so it's, it's a real encouragement to start thinking about it now so that it just doesn't happen and then we're reacting to it. The final one is, uh, well, on this section, is to create a culture where young leaders are supported to do all that God has called them to do in life, not just in ministry. So often when, when things are done with young people, it's done with ministry in mind, when you're raising up young people. And I know so many young leaders who are amazing in ministry and terrible in life. You know, in ministry, they know what to do. They can pray, they can speak in tongues, they can cast out demons, all these things but their personal life is a mess. And there's this saying, and I, and I quite like it, it says that the anointing draws them near, your personality will decide whether they stay or not. And it's so important as leaders that we, we are lovable, you know, that we are personable, that we are real. And I'm not saying this to have a go at anyone, please don't think I'm having a go. This is just, it's what I've seen, it's what I've observed, it's what I've experienced as a young person. I'm gonna share scripture with you from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. And she says, the elders which are amongst you, I exalt, I who also am an elder, so I just have to move this thing, and a witness of the suffering of Christ and also partake of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is amongst you, taking the oversight thereof, 
not by constraint, but willingly, not for dishonest gains, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives, giveth grace to the humble. The reason I share this, this um, verse is I love how it's always, and I say this on behalf of young people, that verse is always used to tell us to be humble. And every time a pastor would bring that verse to me and I'd go, yeah, but the next line says, you should submit to me too. And they would give me this look of how dare you young man. But actually it's a, it's a two way thing. It's a relational thing. Young leaders want to grow. We want to, we want to serve under your ministry. You know, we want to do what God has called us to do, but we really need the space to do that. Anything that we don't give time or space to, we say without saying the words that we don't value. If you tell me you love me and you don't spend any time with me, you don't spend any time invested in me, you tell me I'm not valuable. If someone else is willing to invest their time, their effort in me, I believe they believe, they be, I believe what they're saying. And so this is a challenge, you know, Pastor Sreka said a lot of the stuff I wanted to say, you know, when, when he first mentioned to me about the micro church and, and what we want to do with young people, I was like, oh yeah, we have to do it. And, you know, we, I was there on the sessions and we were pushing these young people. And I remember when Isaac sent that message saying, I've got too many people. And I replied back going, that's the best problem to have. You know, how many of you want that problem as a pastor? We've got too many people in church. You know, hey, that's a problem I'm praying for. And so one of the things we're doing is we're planning now. You know, one of the things Pastor Sreka was talking about is planning. Let's look at young leaders. Let's identify young leaders in our church and let's start developing them. Let's start mentoring them. Let's start supporting them. Let's start explaining to them what we do. There's so much more to ministry than what we see on a Sunday. And if you don't tell me what it is, I'll never know. And I'm just gonna give my own personal example before I finish and, and pass back to Pastor Sreka. We had, the, myself and my wife, we had the privilege of stepping up in ministry over the last year and a half. And had it not been for the people who were stood by us, who were supporting us, who were giving us advice, many of them are on this call right now, we probably would have just made a huge mess of it. You know, I've been in church since I was born. I've done ministry. I've done all these things. But the responsibility of pastoring a church, my God, was more than I'd ever imagined. And so having all the conversations, you know, calling Pastor Sereka, he knows I would call him 911 calls. Pastor, I don't know what I'm doing. And at some point, everyone's going to figure out I don't know what I'm doing. And I would text my dad and, and all these things. And my dad would call me for two hours and he would just, you know, encourage me. And some of you on this call would text me, would encourage me. I'd speak with you. Some of you I still have appointments to sit down with. Please do that with the young people in your church. Invest in them. Don't just use them because they play music or they use the technology or they think, because I've had young people come to me at youth camp and say, my church uses me because I can sing or because I can play an instrument or I can dance or I do drama. And I say, no, the church isn't using, they just want you for your gift. And they go, nobody's asked me how I feel. Nobody knows what I'm going through. Nobody knows where I am. And so it's to have that conversation with young leaders say, I want to develop you as a person not just for you to be useful in the ministry. I want to develop you so that you can be everything God has called you to be. You can be a great husband, a great wife, a great father, a great mother, a great business leader, great in every aspect of your life. And so that's my, that's my encouragement and challenge to you pastors and to us and to me. You know, I, I start all this stuff with me. Gosh, I start it with me. And, you know, we, we've done it. God willing, we've had a year and a half, we've been able to train a youth pastor. And now I'm already talking about succession and people going, you've only been in position a year and a half. Yeah, but I'm thinking about succession because it may have been a year and a half, but at some point God's gonna call me to do something else. God may move me to another country. And what I don't want is the work of the kingdom to stop because I'm not there. So that, that's, my, that's my challenge to you. And it's great to have Pastor Ken on here because he worked through a lot of this stuff with me when we first started the youth work and him and I would have conversations about this, you know, how do we do this? How do we change this? How do we, you know, and he gave me some amazing advice. 
And I just want to encourage you as, as pastors, speak to each other, speak to the young people, find out the heart of this generation, find out the heart of your young people and invest in them. An hour a week could change a young person's life. And that's my encouragement. Take them to McDonald's, well, social distancing, take them wherever, do whatever you need to do, but invest that time. You will see the results in your ministry. You know, I don't want to go on too much longer, but yeah, that's my encouragement to all of you. Whatever you invest, you'll see it come back. I love, I, you know, I, I love what Femi said, that, that last statement, uh, you know, whatever you invest is what is going to come back. And, um, you know, I want to just open this time up. We have a few minutes. If, um, you know, anyone has, a, anyone has a question or, you know, they have, uh, they want to ask a question, Femi's here, I'm here, uh, you know, we, we would love to try and address those questions. But um, something that I'm going to be doing is my next batch of microchurch planters is going to be in the uh, in the middle of November. And, you know, if you have someone that you want to send, you know, I would love to spend four to five weeks with them, training them. And one of the conditions that they come is that they start a microchurch. They don't just come because there's a program or there's no, it's about you have to start your own microchurch. And so, you know, pastors begin to dream, begin to think, you know, what did the Lord really talk to you tonight? You know, some of those questions I put up there. You know, what, is the Lord asking you to, you know, change in the way you do church? 97% of you said yes. But what are some of those changes? And so, you know, tonight has been really about inspiring you, but for you to go back and begin to think and go before the Lord and say, Lord, you know, how do you want, you know, how do you want us to shift and change? You know, our church, we are, we are changing. Um, you know, in a crazy way, but again, it's like, what is the Lord asking you to do? Um, so, any questions? Anyone wants to uh, have any uh, any questions, or if not, we can um, you can just unmute yourself and ask a question. If not, we will close up for tonight. Doesn't look like it. Great. So, you know, I'm going to ask Ken to re actually to pray over us, even as a movement. Yes, Ken Baird. Yes, Ken. <laughs> um, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, you know, if you joined uh, Foursquare recently, um, I, I took on uh, from Ken. And, um, and it, you know, for me, it, you know, he's, he's been a great friend and it's been amazing, you know, that we've worked together for so many years. And uh, so it's a joy for us to have him uh, with us. And even the youth movement actually was, I would say, his baby. <laughs> uh, that is 10 years today. And unfortunately, this year we could not have a huge celebration. Uh, but our youth movement is 10 years. And uh, that's what can, can be. That, that's part of his legacy that he left behind even for us. So over to you, Ken. <coughs> Pardon me. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure everyone would would agree when I say thank you very much for uh, for this evening. I I thought that was excellent and uh, and so helpful. So I I say thanks to everyone for that this evening. Let's just pray, Father. When we when we look at this situation, Lord, uh, we just sometimes don't know what to do. But Lord, I'm so grateful that we serve a God who was not taken by surprise, who is at the very end of this, as well as right here in the present with us. What a beautiful thing about you, Lord, that you're so outside of time that you're already through this COVID situation and waiting for us at the other end. What a beautiful, beautiful savior you are. Father, I pray for the Foursquare family. Uh, I pray for the church in general, Lord, for all your people. Father, help us to grasp this, what I believe is a God-given opportunity for reflection and change, uh, and maybe even repentance, Lord, for being stuck in our traditions. Father, bring us back to the things that are important, 
Uh, as the song says, Lord, when the music fades and all is stripped away, let us come back to, uh, to the heart of worship and the heart of, of serving you. And my prayer uh, tonight, quite simply, is Lord God, would you make us the hands and feet of Jesus in our community and in our nation? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Oh, thank you, Ken. And thank you to everyone um, who, who was with us today. And, um, you know, we will, we will see you tomorrow, uh, four o'clock for all the leaders, youth leaders. Uh, you know, if you have friends, you know, invite them. Um, I'm excited to hear what uh, Randy has to bring to us. And also, don't forget our children's time at 1130. So God bless you all. Have a, have a great night, and we will see you tomorrow. God bless you.